on this next leg of their exploration of Kenya's wildest places, Dosfinkel and family venture into the country's driest and most unforgiving regions to photograph two of Kenya's most hardy and resourceful peoples. The Samburu's hot and arid homeland has for years been cut off from the more developed and populated south. The result is that they've largely been able to keep their ancient traditions intact. Their northern neighbors, the Rendila, are a mysterious people who more than a thousand years ago fled south from the land of Kush in what is present-day Somalia. With the help of Kenya expert George Rumager, Doss and family go in search of Kenya's oldest and most specialized desert people. We're here on the edge of the Kaisu Desert in northern Kenya, the land of the Rendila people. And we hope to find out how these people thrive in this harsh environment. And harsh it is. 22,000 square kilometers of stony desert, where temperatures soar to over 50 degrees Celsius at midday. And there's no running water for hundreds of kilometers. The Rendile are Kenya's camel experts and masters of this fragile environment, staying alive by constantly keeping their herds on the move. Their whole rhythm of life is dictated by the needs of these extraordinary animals. In the constant search for forage, a man and his camels will cover vast distances, going for as long as the camels can hold out without drinking. This warrior is now heading back towards his settlement and watering hole, having survived for nearly two months on only blood and milk drawn from his camels. In this arid place, camels are far more valuable alive than dead. So meat is provided by herds of sheep and goats tended by children and unmarried women. This community and their movable settlement is known as Dupsai Monte. Dupsai is the name of their clan, one of nine in Rendile land. And Monte is their chief elder, who also functions as the spiritual leader or light. <laughs> The Rendile are a religious folk calling themselves the holders of the stick of God. Like the Maasai, they believe in one who can be reached through prayer. The lice is also said to be able to read the will of God through a number of divination methods, such as tossed stones or bones. Mendile <coughs> houses are prefabricated and portable and are dismantled and reassembled by the women on the same day that a move takes place. Decisions in the community are made communally and arrived at after long discussion. Rendila society is based on consensus. A famous saying states that peace is more important than food. These girls are making the final preparations before taking a herd of goats away for a week's grazing in the relatively lush grass at the foot of the distant Ndoto mountains. To avoid moving camp every day, the Rendile have evolved a semi-nomadic lifestyle in which the warriors take care of the day-to-day -day grazing and watering of the camels, whilst the older men, women and children 
occupy settlements which shift two to three times a year. Due to the livestock lost in the prolonged droughts of the last few decades, the traditional Rendile lifestyle is now more vulnerable than ever and in a period of great transition. Large numbers have been forced to settle in townships around mission and aid supply outposts. Here, overgrazing has often turned the surrounding country into near wastelands. Kor today is the largest of these settlements. Hi. In 1976, the UN launched here a multi-million dollar effort to encourage the Rendile to settle down. The idea was that they would sell their meat and dairy products here, and in the process, jobs would be created. But the reality was poverty and unemployment, and Kor became what some have described as an oasis of dependency. For many Rendile, it was not just food, but also a chance to educate their children that drew them to Kor. Faced with increasing drought, it was thought that the risk facing the family would be spread by having at least one child in school, destined potentially for a paying job. In fact, many children have been seriously injured here, and some have even died. This is a horrifying situation, and I absolutely need to find out more. I was told to speak to Herr Kenna, who is running a local project that wants to improve the safety of the wells. Herkenna was born in the desert, but came to school in Kor. He now lives here, with his wife and children. In a sense, he has a foot in both worlds. With a herd of camels grazing in the surrounding desert, and a job as a research assistant in town. He's happy to tell me about the project he's developing, and show me the dangers with many of the existing wells. Yeah, just look at this water, how contaminated it's been. I mean, this gap here, it's far too big and far too low. Herkena explains that each well is owned by an individual family, although water will never be denied to someone else who needs it. Says this one killed the, the last death was a warrior in November. Oh, here. Because they cut half drums, which they put here. They fill them up, and apparently the animals push the drum onto someone who is here, who slipped, and then during the rains, soil and everything get, gets washed in, yeah. contaminating all of these wells. It's all animal dung. And yeah, there's been a lot of typhoid and uh, yeah. other diseases. Anyway, as you can see, this is yeah, a particularly terrible. dangerous one. Then, we see camels on the ridge. After weeks without drinking, they now smell water and begin rushing towards the wells. With 600 kilos on the move like that, it's easy to see how accidents can happen. During the wet season, the water level is relatively high. This means that three men can bring the water up. But by the end of the dry season, when the water has dropped to its minimum, up to seven warriors will be needed. One reason a camel can go for such long periods without drinking is simply the quantities it downs in one sitting, which can be as much as 135 liters 
in 10 minutes. This is just what we didn't want to see happen. A camel has fallen into a disused well. Weighing around 300 kilos, even with 10 people tugging, there's little chance of getting him out. This is a classic example of what happens with the open wells in the area. Camels fall in like this, often catching people inside whilst they're actually, you know, drawing water. <coughs> And uh, as you can see, this time we were lucky. They happened to have ropes and we happened to have a car. But generally, you know, it would involve serious injury or maybe even death of animals or people. The camel here is the most important possession. Any loss is deeply felt, as the Rindile draw from the animal all that's needed for life, milk, blood and transport. On the rare occasions that a camel is slaughtered as part of a ceremony or because it has become lame, everything from the carcass is used, meat, bones and skin. The camel is so central to Rendile culture that even the days of the week and seasons of the year are named after various camel-related activities. Las Rea, are you married? Administrate? Uh, yes. When did you marry? Administrate. Bulewa, a local teacher, helped me talk to Lasaria, one of the warriors. He got married this year and is looking forward to having the biggest family possible. You have your own well, Lasaria? Digging a well in these temperatures is a really punishing job. A good well needs to be dug in solid rock so that the walls don't collapse. Lasaria tells me that this man is about halfway, so still has around two months to go before reaching water. So why are there so many wells? Not too many people live here, but there are wells all over. So he says that basically uh, there's 292. 292 wells. wells. Yeah. Uh, the use per household requires at least one well per household oh, that really? includes people and cattle. When I ask Herr Kenna what his ideal well looks like, he explains that this is a good example. The water is directed through a pipe into these troughs where the camels can drink safely without endangering the men in the well. It's the end of the rainy season, a time for weddings and thanksgiving ceremonies. And the local blacksmith is enjoying his busiest time of the year making bangles and other metal ornaments, and of course, spears. The work is carried out in a way that hasn't changed in centuries. His mother uses goat skin bellows to coax the maximum heat from the coals. Okay, you make spears and you make certain tools, but what are you making most of the time? Raw. No, this one. Okay, these knives. Yeah, oh, knives. Like bell. yeah. oh, even bells. Those bells. Yeah, and bracelets. Oh, oh that's nice. Yeah. Oh, okay.
but it's time to move on. By special invitation from Herr Kenner, in this time of joy and festivities, we've been given a rare chance as outsiders to attend a traditional Rendila wedding. It's planned for tomorrow in Herr Kenner's family village. Following the local custom, presents are given to the villagers before the wedding day. And ours is the traditional bag of sugar, some tea and tobacco. It's also an opportunity for us to introduce ourselves before the big day. Today was another beautiful day here in Rendila country. Every day seems to be full of wonderful moments. But what touched me the most was my conversation with Lazaria. He is one of the young warriors who helps bringing up the water from the deep wells. And I asked him how it was to live here in this very dry desert. And he said to me, well, according to me, this is the most beautiful place on earth and I will never ever leave it. At dawn the next morning we return. The daily activities are underway as if nothing special is happening. Then, unexpectedly, Bertie and Femke are invited into the house of the bride. They learn to their shock that following tradition, on the morning of her wedding, the young bride is circumcised by the women of her clan. It was for us really scary. I have the blood still on my hand. We both were crying and it's really, yeah, yeah it's, it's really so tough. We were I'm shaking sick and, about it, you know. Yeah, but it took so long. Actually, this is a small piece, but they do it so carefully, but so slow. And the girl was in so much pain and, and she didn't even cry. Not one tear. And in, when they were circumcising her, when they were doing it, she was totally quiet. But after that, she was like, she was going to faint. Yeah because she had so much pain. Yeah, and then so she was pain. in a sort of trance, trance. Eh? Yeah. doing like this and, yeah. But it was quite an experience, but uh, I'm still shaking. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, for our Western woman not, uh, not the nicest thing. This event nonetheless marks the most important transition in the life of a Rendile woman. And although the culture is changing fast and moves are being made to introduce alternative rituals, here in the desert, female circumcision is still widely practiced. The groom then arrives from his village with his best men and best friends. A young goat is slaughtered. The blood is collected and mixed with milk as a restorative for the bride. Then from the meat, a stew is made for her to eat later. The bride spends the first day inside her mother's house, lying under a blanket, recovering from her ordeal. Almost as if from a scene out of the Old Testament, the groom brings with him two fattened sheep. The smallest sheep is presented alive. The fattest will be slaughtered and the meat divided up for the bride's family. At this point, the groom and best men take off their shoes. 
They will be held by the bride's family for two days, until the groom moves in to live with his new wife. The father of the groom traditionally pays eight camels to the father of the bride as a dowry. The parents of the bride then usually give one camel to the married couple. Once butchered, two choice pieces of fat are taken into the house and presented as a special gift. Throughout the day, groups of women from surrounding settlements arrive. They sing to the good fortune of the bride. These imposing necklaces, known as burgurchas, are worn only by married women. The Rendile have a taboo against marrying within the clan. And as the girls have few opportunities to meet men of other clans, marriages are usually arranged by the parents and elders. Although the couple can refuse to go ahead with a match, that would usually mean a move away from the settlement. One of the high points of the wedding is when the bride is presented with her own house. In fact, the rendile term for marriage actually means house building. The whole event is filled with symbolism. The materials used to build the bride's new house are in fact taken in part from the home of her mother. This represents continuity in the face of transience, a powerful symbol with deep resonance for a nomadic people constantly on the move. Here, the bed is being made for the newly married couple. <laughs> With the house just partially built, the bride takes her place on her new bed. <laughs> While the women do all the work on building the house, the men arrange freshly cut branches of acacia thorn around the house. This also primarily has a symbolic function, wishing safety on the young couple as they begin a new life together. <laughs> It's now the end of the day. The bride is now in her new home. But she'll have to wait two days before being joined by her new husband. He'll then get his shoes back and the couple can finally begin their new life together. <laughs> The Rendile are well known for their near obstinate resistance to change. Yet their future now lies more than ever in the balance. While the government and international aid agencies continue to encourage communities to give up their traditions, settle in the towns and get an education, the reality is that this will almost certainly lead to environmental devastation.
as overgrazing and the need for firewood turned the larger settlements into wastelands. Many Rendile know that while a few youngsters with an education might find a job, for most that remains an unattainable dream. Life in the Kaisut has never been easy. But within traditional society, someone in trouble will always find help. And one thing's certain, nobody knows better how to celebrate the riches of these savage, fragile plains. The southwestern edge of the Kaisut is bordered by a dramatic line of hills known as the Ndotos. Behind them lies the land of the Samburu, a proud group of cattle nomads whose traditional lifestyle is increasingly under threat from recurring drought. But an enterprising few are trading their cows in for Rendile camels in an effort to hold on to their traditional pastoral way of life. The Samburu were given their name by the Maasai. It means butterfly. This describes both their constant movement and the impression of delicacy and beauty created by their personal adornments. This is in stark contrast to their fearsome reputation as skilled fighters. On this trip, our plan is to reach an isolated community. And as there are no access roads, we'll walk in with the help of pack camels. To reach the camels, we gladly take up George's offer to fly us in. The rugged hills of the Matthews Ranges have a raw primeval beauty. But the most striking features are the Luggers, or seasonal rivers, which run through this country like giant snakes of sand. Finally, George has the grass strip in sight, and we brace ourselves for the landing. But it looks like the strip is already in use. That was close. Not quite what I had in mind for my first encounter with a camel. Camels have always intrigued me and I'm looking forward to this unique opportunity to get to know them. Hi, George. Hello, Hannah. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Hey, welcome to the Milgus. <laughs> We're greeted by Helen Douglas Dufresne, a third-generation Kenyan who grew up on the lush green slopes of Mount Kenya. But 18 years ago, she lost her heart to the Samburu and their rugged country. The welcoming committee is a lot bigger than I expected. 14 Samburu warriors, or Moran, and 26 camels. As we load the camels, I begin to appreciate why there are so many of them. For a trip like this, everything needs to be carried in. Also, many potential dangers lie ahead. 
Spare camels are needed in case of accidents, which can be caused by quicksand, rock falls, or even lion attacks. The team head for the Seya Laga, one of the largest in the country. For the first few days, they'll use this sand highway to head south some 80 kilometers to search out a remote community experimenting with raising camels. In this dry country, the only reliable water source is the lugger. But the peace and calm here is deceptive. The Seya lugger has the reputation for being the most treacherous in Kenya. Each year, people and animals are trapped in the quicksand or swept away in raging torrents that can appear suddenly without warning. The sand in the laga softens. Everyone feels it. The camels are getting nervous. Before a serious accident occurs, Helen takes the lead and navigates a path through the soft sand. That evening, in the most wonderful setting imaginable, we get the first real taste of Samburu culture. A spontaneous performance of song and dance. Most evenings this goes on until late. Their deep resounding calls and rhythmic chants mingle with the natural sounds of the night. We're up before sunrise the next morning, eager to make the most of the cool of the day. To keep our camera equipment running, we have to rely on this small solar panel to charge our batteries. All right, that looks good. Now we're going to connect him, because this camel can only function with solar power. Yes. I guess if the camels are ready, and everyone's set, we might as well take off before it gets too hot, yeah? Yeah. I saw some elephants last night about one yeah. o'clock in the morning down in the lugger. I'd like to have a look and see if they're tracks. Should, yeah. See what else yeah. came to the water hole. Okay. These are very, very fresh elephant tracks. Look, like this is his yeah. little foot and two uh, hands. Him. Yeah. You wanted to see some proper leopard. Tracks. Yeah. There you go. Show me. You can see it's That's perfectly round. Yeah. yeah. There's no nail <laughs> mark, so you know it's a cat with retractable claws. So it came to drink here, right? Yeah, obviously. It's a shame they must have got wind of us and then. And then they ran off. Took off, yeah. But yeah. we'll see where they drank upstream. Yeah. Let's go, guys. Bye. Bye. So apart from. Um, Leopard? No, there's a, also lion and there's cheetah a, here? There's lion and cheetah. We're oh, very really? lucky. We see a lot of cheetah, funny enough. Yeah. But there's plenty of lion here. We've lost about 20 camels in eight years. 20 lion. camels in eight years? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The camel is perfectly adapted to this semi-arid country and is widely used in the deserts north of here as both a pack animal and for its meat and milk. We quickly adjust to the natural rhythms of the day, pacing ourselves to the ambling gait of the camels. By starting at dawn and making regular stops, 
we're able to cover around 15 kilometers before the animals begin to tire. During the first break, we're amazed to see the camels attacking hungrily the branches of the acacia trees with their long thorns. But what they're really after are the coiled spring-like pods with a crude protein level of nearly 40%, they're incredibly nutritious. He loves it. I'm amazed by their anatomy. If you see the elbows, the way they bend them, and the way he's lying, that's amazing. This animal is completely built for the death. <laughs> Because you see the eyelashes, the very long eyelashes, and that is to uh, catch all the sand during a sandstorm. And also the ear. The ear is very small, full of hair, so that sand cannot go in. Yeah, you're good. No, no, no. Okay, no, Franco, no, would you no. like to. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, This is hot. Yeah, well, you'll get used to it. <laughs> By around 10 in the morning, the air temperature is already 40 degrees Celsius. This certainly makes the going more difficult. There's so many baboons over there. Stop, stop, stop. Just stop. There are many. Oh, look, look, look. Thing on there between. But there must that's, be a water hole there. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. thinking. And I think there are more than 100 baboons. Getting close is going to be difficult. If you approach from the left. The yeah. bulk of the it's troop appears to be paying no attention yeah. to us, but a couple of sentries will be keeping a sharp lookout. These baboons are not afraid to show themselves. But will they let us get close enough for a good picture? Olive baboons are well known for their amazing adaptability. The group functions as a cohesive unit organized around a core of related females. With their food well spread out in country like this, the group needs to cover around five kilometers a day in order to find enough to eat. I probably thought I'd better comply. I don't even tap his toes. He does it. You're a very good camel. You know? Most days by two o'clock in the afternoon, we had made our quota of kilometers and it was time to stop, let the camels graze and set about building camp. Getting that hundred kilos off the back is a welcome relief. <laughs> We talk about several lion attacks, even here in the campsite. Yeah. How is that possible? How can a lion kill a big animal like this? <laughs> well, they're, they're, actually camels are very easy to kill because they jump on the back and then the, li the camel swings his neck round and they grab, grab him oh. by the throat. But we've got one camel that's been attacked four times. The lions have jumped onto his back and he knows the only way to save himself is to run for where the person who's looking after them is. Oh, really? And then the, then the lions are scared of people. Oh. They have a great respect for people anyway around here. The camels have already found a drinking hole. Strangely enough, this master of the desert cannot dig for water himself and has to rely on people or other animals to do it for it.
Then, when Helen mentions that she's never known a woman able to light a fire in a traditional way, Femke quickly rises to the challenge. Yeah? Perfect. I will be able to do this. Just got challenge. I'm going to need a bit of this dry elephant dung. I can't believe a woman cannot do this. I'm gonna do this. Let's feel it. It's getting hot, it's really getting hot. I'll keep it in Are you a man or a woman? Come on. <laughs> okay, I can't. <laughs> After 45 minutes of valiant effort, Lelis and Gay manages to get a flame going in just 45 seconds. Well, 50 now. So the only thing you've seen now is that he's the professional. <laughs> and I will be able to do this tomorrow. I will. Once night falls, the camels settle down in a group in the center of the camp. They're now at their most vulnerable. This is when most lion attacks occur. While some camels take turns sleeping, others stay alert, quietly chewing the cud. On some mornings, in that special stillness at dawn, I get the sense that this ancient land and its proud ancient people blend to form a timeless kind of magic. Do you consider these people primitive? I think that the world has got it the wrong way around. I think we're the primitive ones, and I think they've got life correct because you just live with these people and you just feel happiness all the time. You know, if you go to our society, just people don't seem to be happy like when you're with these people. We're the primitive ones. We've lost the plot. Finally, after a long journey through the lugger, we're about to leave the lugger and clearing a path to go into the hills. Spirits in the group rise. Having survived the first major phase of the journey, the group cut a path up towards the Samburu communities that lie in these hills. But the camels don't share the mood. They're not happy on this steep rocky slope. Their soft padded feet, so good for the sandy lugger, are more of a hindrance here. As we climb onto the ridge, a new world opens up before us. Rolling hills punctuated by towering remnants of ancient volcanoes. And the vegetation has changed. There are many different kinds of flowers here, but they're all tiny. You have to get on your hands and knees to see them. I really like the cactus-like euphorbias. Beautifully adapted to these dry conditions, they hold a poisonous white sap. This purple variety produces a dye used by the Samburu to color cloth and leather. This is beautiful. Hello, what is it? Gum Arabic. We use it in the lick of stamps, boil sweets. Chewing gum also? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's used a lot. It's really beautiful. The Acacia Senegal.
Then ahead, we see our first Samburu homestead, the immediate cause of much excitement among the warriors. Uh, basically what's happened is that they, these guys haven't uh, drank cow's milk for a very long time. And uh, when we arrived here, the women offered some, some milk. And the first thing they, they asked was, is it cow's milk? And she said, yes, of course. And that was complete excitement. Mm. Slightly smoky, as usual, because of the wild olive uh, branch they use to sterilize the calabas. Um, it's an acquired taste. I, I don't mind it. I was brought up on this stuff. So. <laughs> That's how they get all their vitamin C, is through this milk. Leaving the camels resting in camp, the team cover the last kilometers on foot. The leader of this homestead, or Ngang, is Kirimboto. With his winning smile, he introduces us to the 28 members of his family group who live here. This is for you? Yes. Yeah. And that's for the children. Yeah. And the sugar is there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's oh, beautiful. Yeah. Milk container. It's yeah. full. So you're, you're Boma. Mm. It's Missouri San. Yeah, Missouri San. <laughs> yeah. Missouri San. Yeah, Tantisana. Samburu villages are small and spread out thinly, so that the grazing pressure on these hills is minimized. Any form of settled farming is looked down upon. Their livelihood and sense of wealth comes entirely from their herds of goat and cattle. The youngest animals are separated from the rest of the herd as it's too dangerous for them to graze the hills. This coop keeps them safe from prowling predators. When I ask Kirimboto how many cows and goats he has, he just replies, many. Counting for the Samburu is thought to bring bad luck. Nevertheless, he knows his herd intimately, and should just one animal be missing at the end of the day, he would know it immediately. George, mm. can you ask her what she's making? No, in the lipon. Can you all? She says she's uh, manufacturing this for her daughter that, that's big. Yeah. Oh, that's her daughter? Yeah. <laughs> Samburu women don't wear the typical flat necklaces of the Maasai. Instead, from a young age, they're given single loops of beads by admirers, which over time merge to form a thick collar. The Samburu believe that by the age of 15 or 16, a girl should have enough beads to support her chin. This is then considered a sign that a girl is old enough to be married. Another reason to have a good collection of necklaces is so that they bounce nicely when dancing. <laughs> a big discussion soon develops. This lady is concerned that she has too few to make the right impression. She says even if no car, she'll walk up to Wamba to get her beads even now. Right now she's ready to go. <laughs> she's, she's desperate for beads. Yeah, she wants no beads. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but all is not well. Kirimboto tells that a recent cattle raid combined with the drought of the past two years has devastated the cattle herds here. He's lost more than 300 in the past year alone. Some homesteads have lost all their cows, and this is putting great strain on the surrounding communities. But Kirimboto's uncle and neighbor, Lenar Yu, thinks he's found the answer in the camel, a beast quite foreign to the Samburu. He says milk at all times, meat at all times, an animal that can withstand the most extreme conditions of heat and still feed the family. He says all of the children around here have survived through drought and everything thanks to the camels. Camels breed at a much slower rate than cattle and are prone to more diseases. But the Nariu is showing that his pioneering work with this remarkable animal can help the Samburu cope with drought. And this is a problem that is affecting more and more their savage yet beautiful home.